update for this antique bathroom, things begin to get complicated as Lionel and Danielle's house takes shape. Well, I'll be honest, we have had a few little hiccups. And finance guru René Rivkin takes Sherl around his country retreat. I love things American, and I think log cabins are archetypal American things. Join us next time for those stories and lots more. Right now, though, here's Paul and the team with money. Tonight, the so-called safe investment that's sending people broke. It absolutely is devastating. Also, insurance car write-offs. How to get the cash and keep the car. And the $20,000 Beatles treasure trove. G'day and welcome to Money. You know, I've been advising people on financial matters for over 20 years now. And during that time, I've seen my fair share of surefire investments. High return schemes that promise to put lots of money in your pocket. But the story you're about to see tonight has got to be one of the most disturbing investment tales ever. Not only because tens of thousands of people are caught up right around the country, but because it involves a profession built around trust. With interest rates at their lowest levels for decades, many Australians who would normally have their money earning bank interest in fixed term deposits are looking to get higher returns. And if you were getting three or 4% interest, but were promised more than 10% on your money with high security, it would seem a very attractive offer. We thought we were going to sit back with our investment, put our feet up and enjoy uh, the fruits of our labour in, during our lifetime. And in fact, at these ages, we're becoming property developers. Dorothy invested $50,000 and her money, along with that of 30 other investors, was lent to a company buying a motel on Queensland's Sunshine Coast. It was all done through what's called a solicitor mortgage, a private mortgage loan set up by solicitors, which gives investors like Dorothy a first mortgage over the property. In return, solicitors earn fees for preparing the documents and often charge an ongoing annual fee of about 1%. And in most cases, the arrangement works very well for all concerned. But in the last decade, quite a number of law firms, in particular here on the Gold Coast, have seen private mortgages as a potential new source of income. And as a result, they've become extremely sales focused, producing glossy brochures and running big advertising campaigns, promising often very high returns. The sales pitch with a solicitor's mortgage is that you get regular monthly interest payments, up around the 12% mark in Dorothy's case, and the brochures indicate your money is virtually guaranteed. If something goes wrong and the borrower can't repay the loan, you hold the mortgage on the property, and when it gets sold, you get your money back. People expect to be able to trust, and that's why I went there. They, they're well-known solicitors. You think that it, they'll do the research, they'll put your money where it's safe, because they are solicitors. Dorothy and the others first became suspicious early last year when their interest payment stopped. And when they found out the people who bought the motel went broke, they weren't too concerned. They figured the property would be sold and they'd get their money back, plus their lost interest. But now the crunch. The motel may end up selling for far less than what Dorothy and the others put in in the first place. At the moment, it's even less than that because the motel has been abandoned and um, it would probably only be worth land value now. But this is not just a story about Dorothy. It involves many other people and several different firms. And just who is getting caught out? Well, tonight here at Broadbeach on the Gold Coast, we've got over 100 retirees. They went to a solicitor for a first mortgage for high returns and in particular, security. But the fact is they've been badly let down. And it absolutely is devastating. A number of investments that we've made have fallen over. You're frightened to tell your neighbours what a damn fool you've been? Well, we're depressed over it because we're pensioners and it was money that we needed to live on. 
While Dorothy still has some hope of getting her money back, most of these people haven't been as lucky. Harold Roygaard's family has lost more than $45,000. We all got the feeling that they were having a little picnic with us. They all seemed to be in for their, for their little bite. Harold's solicitor's mortgage involved eight other investors who handed over a total of $490,000. Another victim was retired shearer, Harold Brown. He's kissed away $16,000. Out of uh, eight investors, we lost uh, roughly about $100,000 principal and $40,000 in interest. So Dorothy, both Harolds and a large number of other investors just like them have had their retirement savings dealt a very savage body blow. But just how could so many seemingly safe deals go so wrong? Well, later in the program we'll show you when we continue our special investigation into solicitors' mortgages which we've discovered nationwide have got estimated losses running in excess of $100 million. Money, 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 money. These cars may look like they only have a few bumps and bruises, but amazingly, they're total write-offs sent here for auction. Well, here's something you may not know. Instead of giving them up, their owners could have kept their wheels and walked away with a healthy insurance payout. sounded like a jet engine right on the top of the roof. These hailstones smashing into the roof, sliding down the roof, it, filling the backyard within oh, five or ten minutes. When Mother Nature unleashed her fury on Philip Cave's 1973 Mercedes, his insurance company had bad news. Uh, CGU assessor has been out to have a look at it and uh, he's written the car off. Still looks in pretty good nick though, doesn't it? Doesn't look bad at all, I'm surprised. <laughs> Not wanting the expense of a new car, Philip decided to do a little bargaining. Well, I said to them, um, look, I'll take $4,000, the write-off's $5,000, uh, I'll take four and keep the car. And they've accepted the proposition. Not a bad deal, especially considering Philip only paid two grand for his car in the first place. The hitch, aside from driving a less than perfect car, is that you can only get third-party property cover until you fix the damage. That means if you're in an accident, the only kind of insurance payout you'll get is for damage to the other person's car and property. Your own car won't be covered. But that doesn't worry Phil. I'm in front. With this car, we usually lose with our cars. Most insurance companies will provide a deal similar to the one Philip struck. Generally, you'll receive the write-off value minus what your car would fetch at auction. So if you can't bear to see your beloved wheels go under the hammer, you might want to follow Philip's lead. It's an old friend. Uh, I've been driving it for a few years. It drives well. It's a safe car. It's cheap motoring. Insurance company finance motoring now. <laughs> Philip Cave, who's certainly got a good investment return out of that Merc. Kelly Sloan, the reporter there. Now a reminder about our tips on shares and managed funds and also our special discounts just for Money Show viewers. First, the three companies I reckon you should be taking a close look at if you're wanting to buy directly into shares. Fosters, AGL and ANZ. They're all expanding companies. Fosters and ANZ with overseas interests and all have good financial outlooks. And here's our cut price deal discounted brokerage fees with two of Australia's leading firms, Morgans and D&D Tolhurst. Buy into one company and you'll pay just $20. Buy into all three and it'll cost you just $50. And we've got just as good a deal for you on managed funds. As you know, this is the way I prefer to invest in shares. The fund managers are the same ones we told you about last year. Advanced Funds Management, Colonial First State Investments and Perpetual Investments. And they've all got an Australian share fund and an international share fund. And here's our special deal. Choose to invest and you won't pay any entry fees. And instead of a $2,000 minimum investment, you can start up with $1,000. As well, you can top up your money with as little as $100 per month. So where do you get it? Well, all the details about our managed fund and share offers are right here in our new monthly magazine. The July issue is out now and you can get a copy at your local Coles supermarket or most news agencies. Could you be sitting on a pile of money and not even know it? Have thousands of dollars in an old bank account without even realising? Sounds unbelievable, but locked away in government vault
Fosters, AGL and ANZ. They're all expanding companies. Fosters and ANZ with overseas interests and all have good financial outlooks. And here's our cut price deal. Discounted brokerage fees with two of Australia's leading firms, Morgans and D&D Tolhurst. Buy into one company and you'll pay just $20. Buy into all three and it'll cost you just $50. And we've got just as good a deal for you on managed funds. As you know, this is the way I prefer to invest in shares. The fund managers are the same ones we told you about last year. Advanced funds management, colonial first state investments and perpetual investments. And they've all got an Australian share fund and an international share fund. And here's our special deal. Choose to invest and you won't pay any entry fees. And instead of a $2,000 minimum investment, you can start up with $1,000. As well, you can top up your money with as little as $100 per month. So where do you get it? Well, all the details about our managed funds and share offers are right here in our new monthly magazine. The July issue is out now, and you can get a copy at your local Coles supermarket or most news agencies. Could you be sitting on a pile of money and not even know it? Have thousands of dollars in an old bank account without even realising? Sounds unbelievable. But locked away in government vaults right now is $181 million worth of unclaimed money. Cash that belongs to ordinary Australians. The big question is, could some of it belong to you? Well, Richard, are you the kind of person that would leave, say, four and a half thousand dollars lying around and not know about it? No. <laughs> well, he did. To be precise, $4,562.21. Jesus Christ. <laughs> to say clothing store manager Richard Lebrow was a little surprised at our news would be an understatement. I just can't so, believe it. You look a bit confused. Yeah, I am. I mean, I just can't understand why I've got $4,000 in the bag and I don't know anything about it. Richard is not alone. More than 20,000 Australians have unwittingly allowed a pile of their own money to disappear into a bureaucratic black hole. My money is in... where? It's in Treasury. It's in Treasury. In Canberra, and it's earning you no interest. So what happened? Uh, what's the yeah. story? I mean... The story is that right now Treasury coffers are bulging with money that could belong to you or your family. In one personal account, we found a staggering quarter of a million dollars. So how could so many people lose so much money? Well, in many cases, it's an old forgotten bank account. All the owners moved so many times, the bank simply lost trace of them. And many people don't realise that if you don't touch your money for seven years, the bank will close your account and send the funds to Treasury. Sydney pensioner Gloria Egan had no idea that she too had more than $4,000 gathering dust in a shutdown bank account. What do you think about the fact you've had this money sitting in an account for years and no one's ever told you about it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm quite surprised. I mean, it's one that doesn't come up before, isn't it? You know, how did you find it ever? <laughs> well, we found it the way anyone can, through this annual government publication, Do We Have Your Money? It's available free at any state library. But be warned, private investigators also use this information. And if they find your name first, they'll probably ask you to pay for details of your windfall. But don't get caught. Remember, it's free at the library. Tonight, murder by the numbers. There's more to this than a simple case of robbery gone wrong. A group of suspects with everything to hide. A blackmail victim for each day of the week. And a debt that must be repaid. An all-new Murder Call, 9.40 tonight on 9. Weather update proudly brought to you by Radiant Laundry Detergent. Money, money. Earlier in the show, we were looking at the pitfalls of investing in first mortgages. And in each case, the problem really comes back to the same thing overly optimistic property valuations. Now, this is best explained by taking a look at the case of Harold Brown and Harold Roygaard, two retirees who between them have lost over $75,000. So just what happened to their money? After being sold on the idea, the investors became mortgagees of this, a 10 hectare property at Eaton's Hill a suburb about 25 kilometres north of the Brisbane city centre. And they were feeling pretty comfortable. 
After all, the property had been valued at $700,000 and their loan was only for $490,000. But here is the catch. This property isn't worth anywhere near $700,000. When law firm Delaney's of Broadbeach offered our investors the deal, Harold Roygaard asked to see the valuation. He was more interested than most because he'd worked as a valuer himself in the past. When I asked to see the valuation, they said, unfortunately, I can't give you a copy, but I can, I can answer questions and tell you all about it. Did that strike you as unusual? Yes, it did. And I, I, I think I said in front of a witness, I said, well, gosh, they've got some strange rules here. If he had seen it, Harold says he would have picked up a few irregularities, like this one on flooding, which said, due to time and monetary constraints, we have not undertaken a detailed flood search. We have assumed that the subject is not flood affected. Now, as the property has a creek on one side of it, you'd think this was essential to work out an accurate value. But no matter what's on paper, the best test of a property's value is when it's put up for sale. Now remember, in 1996, this was valued at $700,000. And just what is this property really worth? Well, much to the investor's horror, in October 1998, it was sold for $420,000. Our investigations revealed some surprising facts about just who has actually been lent the money Harold and the other investors were providing. They were told he was an astute 53-year-old businessman named Henry Sapika. But I find it unbelievable the solicitors didn't tell them two vital points. That Mr Sapika was a declared bankrupt at the time and that the money was actually being lent to his 23-year-old son Aaron who had bought the property, remember, now valued at $700,000, two years earlier for $410,000. We also discovered that two weeks after the investor's money was handed over to Aaron, his father also managed to pay out his creditors and was discharged from bankruptcy. This particular case poses many questions, most directed at Gold Coast law firm Delaney's. But despite our request for a formal interview, they declined, saying, no member of this firm will participate in any interview with the Nine Network. But while Delaney's aren't talking, I can tell you that last month, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission sought an order in the Supreme Court to immediately halt Delaney's from trading in first mortgages. But as I said earlier, this is not an isolated case. Other firms have got problems of their own with solicitor mortgages. Bell Solicitors of Carrara has $1.8 million worth of loans in default. $5.5 million with Mwilumbar Solicitors Halliday and Stanley. Across the other side of the country, investigations continue into the loss of as much as $500 million through first mortgage brokers. In South Australia, the figure's around $20 million. Then there's Titian Solicitors, where 2,500 investors from Albury Wodonga are still fighting to recover $38 million lost two years ago. Australia-wide, experts estimate that over $20 billion is tied up in first mortgages. So it's really important for you to realise that the cases we've shown you tonight only make up a small percentage of that very large industry. In fact, done properly and conservatively, a first mortgage can be an excellent income producing investment. But if you're considering investing, there are some pitfalls you must be aware of. Look, you just can't earn 10 to 12% with absolute security. If you're looking at investing in a first mortgage that is paying that sort of interest, you've got to ask yourself why the borrower would pay twice the interest compared to a standard bank mortgage. And the reason is very simple. Generally, they just don't have the sort of security a bank would accept. So it's in your best interest to make sure you know three things. The borrower's financial history in detail, that their income is sufficient to service the loan, and that the valuation is realistic. Check out local real estate agents. You'll get an indication of the sales price of similar properties. If it was me making the investment, I wouldn't rely on the valuation given to me. I'd get my own. Look, this is an absolute financial disaster. 
for people who put their trust and their money in the wrong place. And I believe very strongly that the laws have to change. People need better protection than this. And to help the process along, we've organised a special forum on solicitors' mortgages to take place on the Gold Coast a fortnight from tomorrow. It'll be at the Southport RSL from 7.30. Entry is free, but you must phone this number to register. We're expecting a big crowd, and to get a seat at this important community event, you must let us know you're coming. I'll be hosting the night, and there will be key people coming along from both government and the legal industry. I really hope you'll be able to join me and we can get something done about a problem that needs fixing. Money, money, money. money. There were large crowds and an even larger variety of treasures at Adelaide's Clipsall Powerhouse for our Sotheby's Antique Appraisal Day. Amazing knickknacks in all shapes and sizes. But the biggest hits came from Gail Doyle, who grew up in Liverpool, England, with the Beatles. Love, love me do. You know I love you. I used to go and watch them at lunchtime, Monday lunchtime especially, and uh, often of an evening. And my mother blamed them for my schoolwork. It's those Beatles she used to say. <laughs> But that friendship with those Beatles has meant that Gail now owns some of the Fab Four's most sought-after memorabilia, including a signed copy of their first number one record, which she bought the day it was released, October the 5th, 1962. Well, John Lennon asked us to buy the record because um, at the time, obviously, they hadn't made any records and they were only popular with the local uh, people and they said buy it to help make us famous so we did and they signed it for us John Paul George and Ringo also signed fan cards all with love to Gail although she says she never got that close to the Beatles my friend I remember Ringo offered to give her a lift home and she said uh, oh, I can't my mum will kill me <laughs> <laughs> Among the rest of the collection, Gail's membership card of the Beatles fan club and of the cavern where the Beatles performed in Liverpool. There are also souvenir programs and another signed photo, this one taken by Gail, and a definite one-off. Look closer. This is even before Ringo had the Beatles name written on his drum kit. Provenance and direct association has become more desirable than just an autograph and being part of I suppose history if you want to call it that and as it develops and you don't know it is until many many years later and I think these things are going to become not icons but very desirable because they want the, the direct feel of the day. So what's it all worth? Well the signatures alone are valued at around ten thousand dollars and the fact that they're on photos, fan cards and a first release copy of the Beatles' original number one hit and Gail's collection is worth up to $20,000. But after you've grown up with the Beatles, money's not what Gail wants. Well, I'm very pleased, but I wouldn't part with them. <laughs> Some great discoveries there with Kim Watkins at her Adelaide Antique Appraisal Day. And now some good news for Sydney viewers. You'll get to find out whether you've got any treasures later this month at our Money Antique Appraisal Day here at the Sydney Showground and Exhibition Centre at Homebush Bay. It's all part of our first ever On The Road Money Show, a three-day expo from the 16th of July, where you'll find out everything you need to know about investing from Australia's top experts. There'll be displays, new products and free seminars, including two a day from yours truly. Then on Sunday the 18th of July, our Money Sotheby's Antique Appraisal Day. Bring along your paintings, jewellery, autographs, any old knick-knack, and the experts from Sotheby's will tell you whether you're rich or not. On Money next week, ATM Fraud will show you how to stay one step ahead of the crooks. And Mobile Phone Debt, how teenagers are getting caught out. Just some of our stories next Wednesday at 8 o'clock. I'll see you then. Good night. International air travel provided by KLM, operating from Australia to over 100 European destinations. KLM, the reliable airline. It's a very, very, very fine house. Tonight's lotto draw is next, followed by changing rooms.